Hello, Mr. Michael Grimo. Yes. How are you today, sir? I'm fine. How are you? I am I am anxious as hell. Uh this is one of my first uh big podcasts. I'm in radio broadcasting school right now and I um I wanted you to be my first guy because I've looked up to you for a number of years in your studies and I um just wanted to reach out and see if I could talk to you and I guess I can. <laughs> well, that's that's really great. It's a, it's an honor for me to help you launch your radio career. <laughs> I know there are a lot of radio talk show hosts who I'm very grateful to for having helped my ideas reach a wider public. And I um I, I, I've seen a lot of your um, lectures that you do. You tour around a lot. And um, normally that goes for about, what, four hours? Well, not usually. Uh, I, I, I would guess uh, a lecture usually lasts 45 minutes to an hour. And then, of course, there's usually time for questions and answers and things like like that. I, I don't recall ever having spoken for four hours. Well, uh, well, maybe I'll send you the link um, that I'm talking about. It was it, it was three hours and change. But, um, okay, we, we don't have much time. We only have an hour. I know you're a busy guy. So if if anyone out there listening to this right now doesn't know anything about you, what would you say epitomizes you? Well, what I focus on is archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. Uh, in other words, I focus on evidence showing that humans have been present on this planet for far longer than most scientists are now prepared to accept. Most scientists today would say the first humans like us came into existence less than 200,000 years ago. And before that, yeah, they would say there were no humans like us on this planet. But in my book, Forbidden Archaeology, I've compiled discoveries of human bones, human artifacts, and human footprints. They go back much further in time than 200,000 years ago. Uh, in fact, going back many millions of years in some, in some cases. So what this means is we need new explanations for human origins. So that takes us into other topics, uh, such as what is a human being, really? And I would say, well, we're not just machines made of molecules. I think there's a conscious self which has an existence apart from matter. So you, you wind up going from the stones and bones into more subtle things. Sure. And um, now I, I know that you are a, you're a, a, a very religious person. In the, yes, that's true. In the in the in the in the Vedics. Yeah, you know, um, I grew up in a military family, and that meant uh, a few things as I was growing up. And my father was an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force, so that meant as I was growing up, I was living in a lot of different places, getting exposed to a lot of different worldviews, and among the worldviews that I was exposed to, the one that made the biggest impression on me was the spiritual worldview from the teachings of ancient India, where I learned uh, about ideas like reincarnation, and it was actually in my studies and the ancient Sanskrit writings of India that I first encountered this idea of extreme human antiquity. So there are a lot of ideas there that made uh, a lot of sense to me. So I became uh, a, 
a disciple of a guru from India. So it's been a big influence in my life. Of course, I don't claim to have any monopoly on truth. I think truth can be found in a lot of different places. I see truth in all of the world's great spiritual traditions. So I, I, I don't claim to have any monopoly on <clears throat> spiritual truth. But, I mean, everyone's got to find something that works for them. It's just like getting a, a smartphone. You know, there's so many different kinds. There's Apple phones and Samsung phones and so many other different kinds of phones and different <laughs> models. You know, you got to pick one that works for you. So there's a lot of variety out there in terms of spiritual paths and traditions. But uh, I, and I respect the decisions that each individual makes about what path they want to follow. And I, I, I try to see uh, gold wherever it exists. You know, you, you might have so many different kinds of coins of different nations or gold jewelry. It may look a, a little bit different, but if it's gold, it's gold. So I kind of look at spirituality like that. It may exist in different forms, but if at the root a person is uh, sincerely trying to understand his own or, or her own self, the self of others, and the supreme self, God, then I respect and value that. That's um yeah that's that, that's a very good uh, view about the uh, the coins is a good analogy, um, uh, I I I do want to touch on how you are suppressed by mainstream science but first I wanted to ask you about the um, the extinction events in the in the Vedic uh, sense there's been six great extinction events. We have to first of all consider that the Vedic cosmology involves a cyclical concept of time. Of course, each all of us experience the cyclical nature of time. Uh, we experience the day-night cycle, for example. You know, day follows night, and then another day comes, another night, and, a, and we adjust our activities according to what part of the cycle we're in. You know, if it's late at night, we tend to be sleeping. Uh, during the day, we tend to be active and working. And then we also experience the cycle of the seasons, at least in the temperate parts of the world, that there's a cycle of seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. And there are even larger cycles of time that people in different cultures had been aware of. In the ancient spiritual culture of India, they were aware of these larger cycles of time, which they called yugas. They have different names for them. And how, how, how did you first get involved in um, the, the Hindu um, beliefs? Well, as I said, I grew up in a military family traveling around the world. So I, I was exposed to a lot of different ideas. But uh, I received a copy of one of the main texts of Indian spirituality, the Bhagavad Gita, um, in uh, the early 1970s, and I read it, and it made a lot of sense to me. So I... Uh, learned that the group that had given me the book had some centers, so I went to have a look at them, and I was, uh, I'm not going to say surprised, but I was impressed to see that there were actually some people that were living the teachings of this book, because there, there are many books of wisdom that have some fantastic teachings in them. But it's rare to find people who are actually living uh, the life of such a book. So I, I 
saw such a community, and I decided I wanted to be part of it. So, but as I said, I don't claim to have a monopoly on spiritual truth or truth of any kind. I think these are decisions that each individual has to make for themselves, and I respect the decisions that each individual makes. Uh, absolutely, and just to give you a background on myself and my religious background, I was brought up Baptist here in uh, North Carolina, and I, um, I, I'm not a biblical creationist, but I think what what you and what Lloyd Pye and other people are trying to say to the world is it doesn't have to be a biblical creationist thing for, you know, to, for, for it to happen. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Well, I think there's some basic principles. I, I'm, I, I think if somebody's a biblical creationist, they have a perfect right to be of that persuasion, and I think they've got uh, just as much a right to be heard as anybody else, including supporters of the Darwinian theory of evolution. So uh, I know some of my work, although it's not uh, directly biblically inspired, but uh, I'm talking about kinds of things that uh, many people who are biblically inspired and in terms of their ideas appreciate. Uh, for example, you know, the idea that humans have been around since the beginning of right. the creation, I think that's something that I would share with a, a person of a of biblical persuasion. We might disagree about when the beginning was. Some people might think it was 10,000 years ago, some people 10 billion. Uh, but I would say we were there, humans were there in the very beginning. They did not evolve from apes and monkeys. They were put here by a higher conscious intelligence in the universe. We can call that God. And so I think there's a, a lot of commonalities you know, between different spiritual traditions in terms of their ideas about human origins and the actual purpose of human life. Yeah, exactly. Much like there's pyramids in different places in the world at the same time when they shouldn't have been together, right? Yeah. Um, I think if we look at the world, we see there are widely separated cultures, separated in time and space, but they have similar ideas about the universe that we live in. They may have similar types of architecture. They may have other kinds of similarities and why is that? I think it's because they're in touch with the same realities, higher realities, and it's reflected in them. So even though they may not be in touch with each other, you could say on the horizontal level, you know, they may be separated from each other in that way, but they're each approaching those higher realities from their own location and time and space and it's, it's, it's as if you had a mountain for example and somebody's looking at it from the east somebody's looking at it from the west somebody's looking at it from the north somebody's looking at it from the south and they're all giving their descriptions of it well it's going to be obvious that they're talking about the same thing uh, the mountain but their descriptions are going to be a little bit different because each one of them is looking at it from a different direction. So I, 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 I see that when I look at the world's cultures. In my book, Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory, I have a chapter on the cross-cultural study of cosmologies. 
and I looked at 30 or more of the world's traditional cultures from different times and different places, and I noted similarities in all of them. And why is that? I think it's because, well, not necessarily that they were in touch with each other on the horizontal level, but because they were in touch with the same higher spiritual realities, they uh, had these similarities in their belief structures and cultures. Exactly. And, and I, you mentioned Charles Darwin. What do you think of his theory and what is your alternative theory? Well, I think, well, first of all, I want to say in one sense, I admire and respect Charles Darwin because at a time when no one accepted his ideas, he had the courage to write his book, The Origin of Species, and put it out there and stand up for it. And now, 150, 200 years later, it's the dominant view in the education systems and scientific institutions around the world. But I think, I think uh, some new ideas are necessary because after 150 years or 200 years, uh, there's still a lot of problems that his theory has not answered. For example, the original origin of life. Uh, Darwin and his followers for the past couple of centuries have claimed that you know, if you just have chemicals, somehow or other they can combine together and form some self-reproducing systems and first living thing. Nobody's ever demonstrated how that could happen, either in theory, and I mean exact theory, not just some vague speculation, and what to speak of actually producing it in a laboratory. That has not been done. It doesn't seem likely that it will ever be done. And another problem is the origin of consciousness. How do you get consciousness out of chemicals, out of matter? That has never really been explained. And even the idea that one biological form transforms into another by a process of genetic variations acted upon by natural selection that has never been shown to be how you get different species in any exact way. Of course, it could be lots of hand-waving. It could say, by natural selection, this happened. By genetic variation, this happened. But if we ask, well, exactly what genetic variations, you know, we, we we don't get those answers in any textbooks or scientific publications. For example, if we want to know well, exactly how did creatures who did not have eyes get eyes? Or how did creatures who did not have wings get wings? We can hear lots of hand-waving partial explanations and assertions that it happened by evolution, it happened by natural selection. But if we ask, okay, step by step, what genetic changes actually took place over many millions of years? And what effect did they have on the biomolecular structure of those organisms such that an eye was produced from creatures who did not have eyes or things like that. You know, yeah. we, we don't get complete, thorough, actual scientific explanations for these things. So I think there's, and plus, there's archaeological evidence 
evidence that contradicts the whole Darwinian theory of human evolution. So I think there's some need to look at some alternatives. And I think the alternatives are going to have to involve a new understanding of what a human being actually is. I think it's very important to ask that question. But before we even ask where did human beings or other living things come from, we should first of all ask, well, what is a human being? What is a living thing? And many scientists today, followers of Charles Darwin, are going to say we're just machines made of molecules. And there's a prominent English evolutionary scientist named Richard Dawkins who put it very nicely in one of his books. He said, we're survival machines, we're robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. So that's what we are. We're robotic machines made of molecules and competition with each other for survival. And I don't think that's true. I don't think that a human being can be reduced to that. I think there are other elements there. I think there's uh, a subtle mind element that has some very unusual powers. Some might call them paranormal powers, even. And then beyond that, there's a conscious self that can exist apart from the brain, apart from the body. It's not material. And when I talk about things like mind and consciousness, I don't mean temporary byproducts of bioelectrical activity in the brain. I mean real things with their own independent existence. So I would say the real human self is that conscious self, which is non-material, which has an origin on what I call the level of pure consciousness. And I would say that's where we're really from. So as conscious beings, we don't evolve up from matter, as most scientists now believe. Rather, we devolve or come down from that level of pure consciousness. But it's a process that can be reversed, and consciousness can be restored to its original pure state. And that is the real purpose of human life, from which we've become distracted by too much materialism in our current worldwide human civilization. Absolutely. Um, when 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 you were talking about Darwin, um, you know, for me personally, and I've lost friends over this, as I'm sure that the scientific community has gotten you down on it as well. I consider what Darwin was looking at as mi- micro evolution, as opposed to macro evolution, as you said, you know, fish to amphibian, amphibian to reptile, reptile, mammal, and so on and so forth. But what he looked at when he was on that island in the Galapagos, he looked at changes of adaptation, not special changes. You're absolutely right about that. And all the, you know, the, the major evidence he gave for his whole theory was the action of breeders. And... Yeah, we can see, you know, you can breed horses of different sizes, you can breed dogs with different lengths of hair, but, you know, they're all still dogs, they're all still horses, Uh, you can breed pigeons of different kinds, but they're all still pigeons, and you're not getting anything really new, you're just, as you say, getting variations, you're not getting change of species. Yeah, exactly. No one's saying that, um, you know, different races of human beings on the planet right now are different species. Right. You can get different varieties. Yes. You can get that, that much he explained. Uh, so, it, it, so he really didn't explain the origin of species. What he explained scientifically was the origin of varieties so what's 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 the worst thing that has been said about you for denying uh, mainstream Darwinism well you know I 
know, there's, uh, well, let's see, what did uh, Richard Leakey say about me? He said, your book is pure humbug, nobody would take it seriously, but a fool, uh, you know, you, you get that kind of thing. But it's not that all scientists are in that category. You know, basically, I, I've gotten three kinds of reactions from scientists because they're not all alike. But I, I, I tend to break them down into three different groups. One group I call the fundamentalist materialist. And they're very much opposed to the kinds of things that I write and say. They don't want to hear them. They don't want anybody else to hear them. Uh, you know, sometimes you know, they try to cancel lectures that I've been scheduled to give and things like that. And, you know, their supporters of the Darwinian theory of evolution and some other materialistic scientific theories, not so much for scientific reasons, genuinely scientific reasons, but more or less for ideological reasons. They support the Darwinian theory of evolution because it tends to confirm their prior belief in atheism and materialism. So that's one category. As I said, they call me all kinds of names and everything you could imagine. But there are other scientists who are more open-minded they may be supporters of the Darwinian theory of evolution and other materialistic scientific theories, but more or less for genuinely scientific reasons. You know, it, it, it seems, the, these ideas based upon what they know as the evidence seems reasonable to them, and therefore they support it. But they're open-minded enough to be able to be willing to listen to alternative ideas. And it's scientists in that category who have invited me to speak at some of the leading scientific institutions in the world, like the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, the Royal Institution in London, and several others. They've also invited me to speak at universities all over the world. And I've been able to present papers at mainstream international scientific conferences organized by such scientists. And they've been willing to accept my proposals to present papers at these conferences. Actually, my latest book, My Science, My Religion, is a collection of 24 papers that I've presented at mainstream scientific conferences about my work. So there's this open-minded category of scientists. They may not agree with me, but at least they're willing to listen to some new ideas, to some alternative proposals. And I think that's very important because if ideas are going to change, the very first thing is people have to be willing to at least listen to a new idea and keep open the possibility of being persuaded. Right, yeah, it's a, so, it's, it, it, it's a good step forward. But do, do you think that most scientists are afraid to come out with uh, the beliefs that, that you put out or, or that they actually believe in fear of being blacklisted? Well, I, I think that that does happen. The scientists who actually agree with me at this point in time are very few and number. And it is a fact that those who are very much attached to the current theories and are very much opposed, most, most there's, there's a development over the past several centuries in the world of science. They 
Dave, what Dave, if you went back to Europe, say, five or six centuries ago, you'd find that their scientific view of the world was very much involving things like non-material substance, subtle energies, higher intelligences, the ideas of intelligent design and creation and things of that sort. Those ideas were very much a part of the scientific establishment five or six hundred years ago, even in the West. But over time, Western science decided to eliminate non-material substance, and they also decided to eliminate any appeal to higher intelligence in explaining uh, some of the order and complexity that we observe around us. So they're very much opposed to reintroducing these things. Yeah, is, the, course, it, is there a stigma in creationism? That that, that that says that you that you know people who believe in creationism are automatically you know Bible people like that. Well, whatever their creationism is based on, be it the Bible or the Vedas or anything else, uh, they're very much looked down upon in the world of science today. However. Uh, my reply to that would be, well, it's either a fact, either it is or it is not true that there is some higher intelligence involved in the origin of life and the origin of the universe and the origin of species. Either there is or there isn't. And it should be a matter for scientific investigation to determine whether or not there are any scientifically visible signs of creation or higher intelligence in the world. And I don't think it's exactly scientific to a priori in advance rule that out. It's like, you know, they want to say, well, science is a game and this is the rule that we play by. Uh, you can't bring in higher intelligence or non-material substance. Well, <clears throat> that may be your rule, but you may be leaving out important features of reality, perhaps even the most important ones. So you may want to play your game of science in that way, uh, you may want to do that, but it's at the expense of having a really complete and true picture of the world that we actually live in. <clears throat> exactly. Um, I'm going to do like sort of a lightning round with you. Um, what is the best piece of evidence for um, humans living longer than mainstream science says? just one particular case. To me, the most significant thing is there are hundreds of cases of archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity, it's... enough to fill up a 900-page book. But of course, among them, I do have my favorites, and one of my all-time favorites is the California gold mine discoveries. In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California. Miners came there to get the gold, and they were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And, you know, they were finding human bones and human artifacts deep in the tunnels of the solid rock and layers of rock that modern geologists can, uh, consider to be about 50 million years old. And these discoveries were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney in a book that he wrote that was published by Harvard University in the year 1880, but we just don't hear about these discoveries today because they contradict the accepted theories of human origins. And how does that have to do with Lucy? I know that you talk about Lucy a lot. Well, Lucy is a name for... 
1970s by some American scientists and Ethiopian scientists who were working in Ethiopia. Um, Don Johansson was one of the American scientists involved in the discovery. And this creature was about three feet tall, very ape-like in many of its features. And the scientists who discovered it believed it was a human ancestor. Of course, they were Darwinian evolutionists, and they believe human beings evolved from apes. So they're very eager to find uh, creatures intermediate between humans and apes that they can call human ancestors. Now, I think these creatures existed, but I don't think they were human ancestors. I mean, technically, they called this creature Australopithecus afarensis. Hominids. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I think it was just another variety of ape or monkey, and there were humans like us coexisting alongside this ape or ape man or very uh, primitive ape-like creature about three feet tall who was existing between three and four million years ago. So I think it's just, I mean, just there's so many other apes and monkeys. This is just another one. And, you know, this, this, this... Now, but what they do as a propaganda technique is give, to try to humanize it. They give it a name like Lucy. And, you know, then you begin to think, well, my mother's name is Lucy, or I've got a cousin named Lucy. And you begin <laughs> to think. You begin to identify. It's a relative. Yeah, exactly. And um, Dr. Pai uh, talked about how, you know, creatures like uh, Sasquatch are probably the the descendants of apes, whereas we are not, and they still exist. What's your opinion on that? Well, in my book, Forbidden Archaeology, I have a whole chapter on evidence for living ape men. So, it's not that I don't think ape men existed in the past. I think they did. But if you look at all the evidence, what you wind up with is a picture of, yes, ape men existed, apes and monkeys existed, but human beings like us also existed. So that the basic picture you get is one of coexistence rather than evolution. And I think we're still coexisting with some of these creatures today, uh, you know, the, the Yeti, the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, Skunk the Apes, yeah. they have different names for them in different parts of the world. Absolutely. Well, you know, you you um, you um haven't been on Ancient Aliens as much as some of the other people, um, the Greek guy with the big hair, <laughs> but... George Hill. Right. But um, <laughs> what do you think is true and what do you think is false from ancient aliens the show well some of the people on the show use the idea of ancient aliens to dismiss the idea of god i don't accept that you know they think well, in ancient times, people saw astronauts from other planets come here, and they were so amazed by their technology that they began to worship them as gods. And that's how our idea of God came about. And really, there's no God. I don't agree with that kind of suggestion or idea. I think both things are possible. There can be God, and there can be ancient aliens. So that, that's a message I tried to get across in, when they interviewed me. But, you know, like, when you're on a television show, then they interview you for an hour and they'll take a minute, you know, from what you've said. Um, I, but I do congratulate History Channel for having the courage to air a series like that because despite whatever disagreements that I might have have had with some of the 
things said by some of the people on the show. Basically, overall, I think it's healthy that large numbers of people all over the world got more exposure to the idea that we're not alone in the universe, that um, there are other human-like species in other parts of the universe, and we've got to acknowledge that, I think, at some point. But I kind of take the idea of aliens and extraterrestrials further than many of the other researchers who appeared on the series. I've got an expanded conception of what it means to be an extraterrestrial or an alien. I would say we're all extraterrestrials in this sense that ultimately uh, what we are is a conscious self. You could call it the soul. We're not the body. We're the soul, ultimately. And that soul or particle of pure consciousness does not originate in this world of matter. It has a higher origin. So I would say in that sense, we're all extraterrestrials. And I would also say that Creatures that correspond to what people call God and angels are also extraterrestrials, not flesh and blood extraterrestrials, but extraterrestrials in the higher sense of the word, higher beings, spiritual beings who come to this world for the purpose of giving people true knowledge about their actual situation and what their destination in life should really be. So, overall, I thought the series was productive. I thought it made a real contribution to public knowledge about these topics, but as I said, I, I don't agree with everything. Everybody. Right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that... Um... I, I I can't recall if if Lloyd Pye was on there, but I know that uh, uh, Stephen Greer wasn't on there. Are you familiar with him? Well, is he the one who's involved in disclosure? Project? Yes, yes, or, yeah, and he, he he's big in the whole um you know spirituality and uh, contact with other beings as well. Yeah, I I appeared in some conferences that he's spoken at, that we've both spoken at. Okay, um, well, okay. What would be the one thing that you would tell people who are new to this information, who have never heard of forbidden archaeology, the hidden, the hidden history of the human race, they've never heard of it. What would you say to them that would get them interested? Well, I think it's very important of us understand who we are and where we came from, because it's our sense of identity that allows us to form our goals and objectives and values in life, and it, and it allows us to act in our own self-interest. If you don't know what your real self is, you can't act in your own self-interest. You're going to have a false conception of yourself, and therefore you're going to do things that aren't really in your own best interest. So that's ultimately what's at stake here. Uh, the question, who are we? Where did we come from? For example, if I think I'm an American man, then I behave like an American man. That's my sense of identity. So... For the past several centuries, past couple of centuries, the supporters of the Darwinian theory of evolution and other materialistic scientific ideas have had the power through the government enforced monopoly they have in the education system to dictate to people their sense of identity. And they've been telling people, you're just evolved apes, you're just machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. In other words, they've been giving very materialistic concepts of self to people. So it's not very surprising.
surprising to me that our whole worldwide human civilization has become extremely materialistic. And because of this, there's a lot of problems. Yeah, it's a... Our whole worldwide human civilization. So I think to get at the root of it, you know, we, should, we have to have a, a true conception of who we are and where we came from. And that is what I think people will get out of reading uh, my books. They'll see, well, there's archaeological evidence that contradicts this idea that we evolved from apes. There's scientific evidence showing that we're not just machines made of molecules. We've got a higher essence, a self that's made of pure consciousness or spirit. And it needs to be taken into account in the way that we live our lives. So I think that's what's at stake. Because you you could say, well, what difference does it make whether, you know, there's archaeological evidence for humans existing millions of years ago or this or that. Ultimately, what's at stake is our conception, our true conception of ourself, and what it means for the lives that we live every day in this world. Yeah, what is what is what is the purpose if if we don't know where we come from or any of that? I think I think it's detrimental to uh, say the strong survive because that's I mean to me it seems like it's it's biased to other beings saying they're weaker, they don't deserve life, which is not true. Yeah, I'm not, I think this idea that we're machines made of matter in competition with each other for survival is responsible for, to, at least to some extent, maybe not totally responsible, but to some extent, it's responsible for the intense levels of conflict that we see on all levels of human society. There seems to be a, a lack of respect and, and a lack of humanity, you know, and, and and what's going on in the world, the level of conflict among individuals, classes, races, nations, religions even. So I think that you know, we need some new ideas about who we are and where we came from and where we should be going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you've been at this for a long time, and you know... You can't go on forever. I, I can't go on forever either. But what what is next for you? What do you want your legacy to be? Well, I would want my legacy to be is that you know, I'm someone who honestly stood up for what his convictions were, even though it wasn't very convenient I, I would like to be remembered for that. And I would hope that for at least a few people, they've been able to change the way they look at who they really are as a, a result of my work and gotten a higher conception of self that actually helps them lead a better and more fulfilling life and a more with a, a greater sense of self-satisfaction <laughs> well absolutely well you've definitely changed it in my life um so what do you have going on next i i, I noticed that you have a uh, convention coming up that george nori's in yeah yes that is uh, i think it's called the human survival conference and uh People can learn about these events that I'm going to be speaking at on, on my website, mcremo.com. That's going to be in Los Angeles at a hotel near the Los Angeles airport at the end of March. The details for that can be found on my website, mcremo.com. In June, I'm going to be a speaker on a cruise ship that's going up to Alaska. And I'm going to be joined by many other researchers and alternative science healers uh, of various kinds, psychics and people of, of that nature. So it's going to be a, 
quite an interesting cruise. I'm going to be speaking about my work there, but if people want to learn about that, they could go to spiritualcruise.com if, they, if they're so inclined to go. Um, give me as a, as a referral, as their referral. And uh, as I said, if people do want to keep up with my upcoming lectures and interviews and things like that, the information is on my website, mcremo.com, mcremo.com. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link to that uh, below. But um, besides all the heavy stuff, all the science and all that, what do you like to do for fun? That, 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 that is so awesome. Um, for people um, who are first hearing from you now, I know I already mentioned this before, but what would you say is the most important thing to focus on in this life? and ethics, I mean, these things are really important to think about, especially when you see all the violence going on in the world today and everything. Um, well, in turn, moral, moral and ethics too, but ultimately we have to consider our happiness. You know, we want to exist in the most happy state. We don't want to undergo needless suffering. So if we want to achieve a position like that, I think we have to live life in, in, a, in, a, proper, in a proper way. And that requires knowledge. So, and I don't mean necessarily the kind of knowledge that you get in the ordinary education system, but I mean, knowledge of the real self within so that it begins to shine forth and because I think ultimately the self is meant to be eternal, full of knowledge, full of spiritual pleasure and it, it, it's actually possible if one learns how to tap into those inner resources. So there are traditions of contemplation, meditation, and prayer whereby people can tap into those spiritual resources that are within everyone. So I would just encourage people to take up 
some process like that. Okay. Well, uh, b- b- before we go, I just want to say I look up to you. Who do you look up to? Well, I have my spiritual teachers, and of course, I, I, I'm also inspired by you know, the activities of my you know, people I know, friends I know, who are struggling against difficulties. They may be difficulties of health. Uh, you know, I, I know one friend of mine is undergoing some health crises, but I can just see he, he just keeps going on and going on and going on. It's an inspiration to me. Absolutely. I have a friend in the hospital right now who's having heart surgery, and, um, you know, I'm praying for him as well. Um, well, I know we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour, so um, is there anything else that you would like to, uh, to say um, without me um, well, instigating a question? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I think that yeah, we've, we've covered a, a lot of topics here. And I would say, you know, the people, if they're, they're, if anyone who's listening has, you know, become a little bit interested in my work, I would recommend that the first book of mine that they look at uh, would be a book called The Forbidden Archaeologist. It's a collection of columns that I wrote for Atlantis Rising magazine. So they're all short. They're easy to read, and they cover different aspects of all the different kinds of research that I do on different topics, whether we're talking about the forbidden archaeology topic or research into the paranormal or evidence for uh, the existence of a soul, higher intelligence in the universe, and things like that. I, I would steer people towards that that book absolutely well I will send a link to your website and where that book is available and uh, uh, sir it's been an honor I hope to meet you in person someday I know that we're on opposite coasts but hopefully I I, I really do want to meet you in person one day well I'm looking forward to that myself and hopefully it'll happen sooner rather than later Absolutely. Well, I hope you have a wonderful evening on your Pacific time because it's uh, getting late here on the East Coast and we have a lot of snow, in case you <laughs> didn't see. <laughs> well, we've got it in the mountains out here. You know, you can, you know, in Los Angeles, you know, you've got the beaches, you've got the city, you've got the mountains. In the mountains, there's snow. People go there and ski and snowboard. I don't, but I've heard many people do. Everything just shuts down here. As soon as there's one snowflake, everything shuts down in North Carolina. <laughs> it's it, it it's like snow doesn't exist. Yeah. It's like oh, what's I this? <laughs> still there? Oh yeah, I'm oh. still here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, 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 I've seen snow. I've been in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was just trying to give you the situation for that most my, for most of my life, somehow or other, I've wound up living in places like Florida and California and Southern Texas and Hawaii and places like that. Man. So, Well, you, you, in my you, early years. You, you, and then when I was in the Navy, I was stationed in Iceland, at a weather station in Iceland. So wow. I've had my experience of cold weather. You are a lucky man of travels, and I hope to someday when I graduate school to be able to travel. I haven't been many places in my life, but... Um, well, I think there's advantages and disadvantages, you know, to a lot of traveling. of staying in one place is you develop a 
deep relationships with people, your friends and relatives and community members over the course of long periods of time, and you get a sense of place and community and self. And uh, it, it, the disadvantages it may seem a little bit limiting. And in terms of, for me, I guess it's just been my karma to travel. It's been my fate to be always traveling, even since my very young years. And there's some advantages to that. You, know, you could say it widens your perspective. You get to see a lot of different places and people. And, but then, you know, the, the disadvantages, sometimes you uh, might feel a little rootless. You know, so there are advantages and disadvantages to traveling and staying put in one place. Yeah, very, very well said, man. Well, um, hey, uh, how, how did I do? <laughs> did well, I... I, I think you've, you've got a radio announcer's voice, I think. Uh, and I, I didn't... If you hadn't have told me, I wouldn't have known that this is your first show. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, can we do it again in a year? Absolutely. Well, I hope you have a great night, and I, my, my, mm, I am about to tear up, man. You, 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 you really made my night. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you, uh, ha have a good one, and I'll, I'll keep in touch. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, uh, sign, <laughs> scientist, uh, Michael Cremo, wow, I'm, uh, I'll have to admit that I was a bit anxious, but, uh, I, um, he said he didn't know that I was first, first time, so, okay. All right, well, guys, uh, if you're listening to this, have a great night, morning, day, afternoon, whatever. And uh, stay tuned for the next one. I'm going to land another big one.